Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. We have a very special guest today. Now, I've seen a documentary on TV. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the Gangland series on the History Channel, and I've seen an episode on there. It's been some years back, and it followed a guy by the name of Jay Dobbins, who infiltrated one of the most notorious motorcycle groups there is, the Hells Angels. And I reached out to him when I started this podcast. He was one of the first people that I wanted to sit down with when I started this whole thing. And he coaches football, so he was, you know, a little preoccupied with that. And we understood. And we were able to get together and sit down uh, for this interview to bring to you people. And I am just super stoked. He's got an amazing story. So we're going to get right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Crime and Entertainment jay dobbins jay how are you my friend thank you thank you for having me wade and thank you to your audience and uh let's chat absolutely well we have a lot to unpack here i mean you've got you know a football career you move into law enforcement you you damn near get killed right off the rip and then that's not even counting you going in and trying to infiltrate or succeeding in infiltrating the hell's angels so we've got a lot to get down here, but first let's start with where did you grow up originally? Where'd you, where'd you grow up? Well, I was born outside uh, Chicago, just over the state line in Indiana. Uh, I lived there as a kid um, and moved uh, with my folks. My dad was looking for work and moved to Tucson, Arizona. And so I consider Tucson my home. You know, I grew up here for the most part from when I was in uh, elementary school. I went to high school here. I went to college here. Um, I've come and gone from town a few times uh, through work and other things, but like Tucson is home. Tucson is home. Now, you were a standout football player uh, in college. Was it the same way in high school? Was you highly recruited coming out of high school? How was how did yeah, that? Yeah, you know what I was. I got a lot of attention coming out of high school. I had a lot of opportunities to, uh, to play college football, some very uh, prestigious programs had uh, had hunted me. Um, I tell people all the time I was a, a very, very good high school football player. I was a good fo college football player and I was a terrible pro. <laughs> um, so with all the, the schools that were, you know, requesting your service, you chose Arizona. Is that correct? Well, you know, I actually went to the University of Arkansas for a year. Oh, um, really? I, I played for Lou Holtz at Arkansas. Um, my first year in college, uh, transferred to Arizona, played my last uh, uh, years of eligibility at the University of Arizona for the Wildcats. And, uh, and I did, I, ha I had a, I had a nice college football career. Um, how, was, how was your experience with Lou Holtz? Uh, I think Coach Holtz is a brilliant coach. Uh, I think he's a smart man. He's, uh, he's a handful. <laughs> I'll tell you that he's a handful, but he's a, he's a very, he's a very good football coach. We didn't uh, necessarily see eye to eye, yeah. um, but I have a ton of respect for him. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely got the, the accolades and awards. Now he coached down here in South Carolina for a few years. That was kind of towards the end of his tenure, but uh, I used to get a kick out of him after he got done coaching. He was an analyst and just getting him, him getting excited was a, uh, I got a kick out of those. I'm only imagine actually being a player for him, the kind of excitement he probably had out there and his mannerisms and things he done and said on the field. Yeah. He's a, he's a smart coach. He's a demanding coach. And I, th I think one of the um, uh, tests of time for him is that no matter where he's coached, maybe with the exception of his very short uh, stop with the New York jets um, everywhere he's coached in college, he's been a big success. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what position did you play? I was a, uh, I was a wide receiver when I was a kid, when I was a, when I was young, um, okay. you know, it's, uh, over the last 40 years, I've eaten my way into a three point stance, but back in the day <laughs> I was 180 pounds. <laughs> now do you stayed at wide receiver when you transferred up to Arizona? I did. That's what I played in college. Um, you know, when I played in the uh, early eighties, I was in college. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's like, I, uh, I coach high school football now. And I, and I tell the kids, they look at me and shake their head. I'm like, I'm, I was playing wide receiver when wide receivers still gotten three point stances. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about, 
your tenure there with uh, Arizona and Arkansas, did you have any like major bowl games? What was kind of like the the pinnacle of your careers there as far as like, you know, major games? Yeah, we had um, we had some really good games. We beat uh, uh, USC in the Coliseum. Uh, we beat Notre Dame in South Bend. Wow. Uh, um, we've, we, every game that I played in against our rival at Arizona state, I won every rivalry game that I touched the grass in. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I think what's, w- what I find interesting from my college career really isn't about me. Um, it's about some of the people that I played against. Uh, when I was at Arkansas, I played against Eric Dickerson when he was at SMU. Wow. Uh, Mike Singletary was at Baylor. When I got to Arizona, I played against uh, Marcus Allen at USC, uh, John Elway at Stanford. Um, you know, some, some of the, the best football players, uh, not only of that time, but in the history of the game, like I got to share the field with those guys. I was never on that level. I was never that kind of player. Um, but those are really great memories I have. Uh, as a kid, um, none of us really knew how amazing they would be as professional players, but right. man, it was, that was pretty cool. I, that's like a laundry list of hall of famers. You just named off right there, man. I mean, yeah. those are some, some top notch guys. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's very cool to be able to say you shared the field with some of those guys and watched them, you know, performed. Is there anybody that you seen when you were playing that you just knew? that guy's going places. Well, I'll tell you a story. And I I think it ties kind of everything together is when my, um, when my senior season was over, I got invited to the uh, NFL combine. Uh, The, you know, the NFL for the fans that don't know what that is. The NFL combine is like the NFL's meat market. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a camp and an invitee camp where, um, prospective football players come to get tested and you run and jump and they weigh you and measure you and put you through a battery of tests, all, you know, scouts and coaches, uh, evaluating these kids trying to decide who can help their organization. So I go to the combine and, uh, for the drills, I get paired up with a couple guys that were my size, uh, my build. Um, one kid was from Cutstown state. And I remember shaking his hand and saying, man, where's cuts down? And he saw it's in Pennsylvania. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, I, like I'm going to whip your ass today, dude. <laughs> that was my internal dialogue. You know, I, like I, I was an all pack 10 wide receiver uh, in the most dynamic offensive conference in the country. Um, I, th- this was my chance to shine. This was my chance to prove myself. Another guy that was in my group was from a small school in Mississippi. So we start working out and I'm telling you like 10 minutes into the drills, I realized I wasn't going to play f- professional football. <laughs> um, like I couldn't do, I'd never heard of these dudes and I couldn't do what they were capable of doing. They were more athletic than me. They were faster than me. They could jump higher. They were more skilled. Um, and I was, it was my, like, I never had a plan B. I only had a plan a, right. and my plan a crashed. Um, now, the backstory to that is the, the kid that was from Cutstown State was Andre Reed, who went on to play 15 years for the Bills and played in four Super Bowls and was part of their, their dynasty with Jim Kelly and is now in the Hall of Fame. And the kid that was from the small school in Mississippi went to Mississippi Valley State. It was Jerry Rice, um, oh, yeah. who's arguably, you know, the greatest football player to ever put on a helmet and shoulder pads. Yeah, so at the time, <laughs> yeah, man, at the time. Like we didn't know who, uh, how amazing they would be. Um, They probably didn't know how amazing they would be. Um, So I wasn't necessarily judging myself against the fairest competition, but nonetheless, um, those, those, those guys, they were amazing, amazing football players. Yeah. That's two, uh, you know, hall of famers right there. So that is tough, tough company to judge yourself by Now you actually, I heard a story Cause I've been doing some research, you know, on some other podcasts, you actually had a funny little run in with the just win baby guy himself, Al Davis. You want to share that story with us real quick? I, I sure I do. Yeah. Um, we, uh, were at the combine that I just mentioned at this test and, and Al Davis was on the grass doing evaluations and he, 
Uh, for your fans that don't know, Al Davis is an iconic figure in the National Football League, was instrumental in bringing the American Football League and the, and the NFL together and um, was just uh, a key part uh, in, for a lot of reasons in, in the development of professional football. And so, uh, so Al Davis is on the grass and I went up to him and I said, hey, Coach Davis, man, I've always been a Raiders fan and um, how am I doing? And he looks at his scorecard and he finds my name and he's like, Dobbins, you're the fastest slow guy I've seen today. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it didn't matter. I was, I was undeterred. I like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't discouraged by that. It was, he wasn't lying to me. Right. Um, you know, and, and again, with another kind of uh, Oakland Raiders nexus to my story, I ultimately ended up uh, playing part of a season in the old United States Football League with the Arizona Outlaws. And when I was there, my wide receiver coach was Fred Bolitnikoff, who was my my childhood idol, my childhood football idol. Because right. like any kid who was ever a possession receiver, uh, that's my age, always wanted to be Fred Bolitnikoff. Yeah, well, still got an award for him, right? The Bolitnikoff Award. Yeah, yeah you know, like in that era when I was a kid, uh, you either wanted to be Fred Bolitnikoff or Steve Largent if you yeah. were a pass catcher. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, how did that play out? Did you did you wind up going to the draft? Was it undrafted, or how, how did that work out? Or I was you- I was undrafted. Um, I I I felt like I I I knew I'd probably be a late round pick. I felt like I right. deserved to be picked. I felt like I tested pretty well. Um, obviously, um, the scouts, uh, didn't see things in me that I saw in myself. Uh, you know, I probably had a higher, uh, evaluation of myself than, than I should have. Um, I wasn't drafted. Um, I played a part of a season in the Canadian football league with the Ottawa Rough Riders. I played a part of a season in the USFL. Um, I was in the USFL when the league folded, um, when they, they lost their lawsuit and, right. and uh, folded up the tent. And so um, I got a taste of it. I got a taste of that life, not what I expected or not what I dreamed of, but man, I played it out. I, I, I went as absolutely far as the God-given ability that I was uh, graced with, the, the talent, the energy, the effort, the enthusiasm. Um, I didn't leave anything on the table. I have no excuse. Um, there's a lot of people that don't make it athletically and oh, yeah. they want to have something to blame. Oh, I hurt my knee. I hurt my shoulder. The coach didn't like me. I, you know, man, I don't have one excuse. I just flat out wasn't good enough. Well, I mean, and you say wasn't good enough. That's not in any way to, to cut yourself short because getting to where you were is a dream for a lot of kids you know, just to, to the point to where you were in life at that, to be able to do that. Hell, to even like, get to go to the combine. I mean, you know, I think one or 2% of the kids that play high school football, play college football. Yeah. Um, another 5% of the co- kids that play college football, play professional football. Mm-hmm. Uh, you start crunching those numbers. Uh, I was blessed. I was yeah. blessed to have the experiences I had. Um, uh, very fortunate and uh, that there's a lot of people, a lot of frustrated athletes who would love to have the experiences that I had. Um, I'm a frustrated athlete. I would have loved to have some of the experiences that some of those names that I mentioned had. Um, it was not part of God's plan. Right. Well, what was part of God's plan is what you would go on later to do, but how did that first come about? Like, how did you make the jump from, you know, trying to do it as an athlete to becoming, you know, a police officer. Wade, like we mentioned, I said, I never had a plan, uh, plan B, right? Like I, like that was my, my whole life, my whole uh, youth and my young adult life was geared around playing football. Everything I did uh, was focused on that. And um, there's not a whole lot of good things about me, but one of the things I can do very well is I dial in. If I set my mind to something, I dial in and um, uh, I did my best. That didn't work out. And like a lot of young people, I was sitting there uh, somewhat lost. Um, I didn't have uh, an alternative action plan. And um, at the time, this will sound hokey now, um, but this is a very honest answer. At the time, the television show, Miami Vice was very popular. Mm -hmm. Um, And and, and in in the mid 80s, as an audience, we had not seen police shows like that. 
everything had been very procedural. It was uh, uniform cops and detectives and, and being reactive to crime scenes and doing interviews. And, um, you know, it was, it, it, it just, we hadn't really seen anything like Miami Vice. And then Sonny Crockett shows up on the scene and he's wearing a Hugo Boss suit and he's got like his gun and a shoulder rig and he's driving a Lamborghini around South Beach and he's meeting these fabulous drug kingpins at mansions and there's tons of cocaine in the harbor waiting to be delivered and there's these you know stripper models bringing a mojitos by the by the pool and i remember watching that i love that show and i was like man like I, like i wonder if that's real i wonder if i could do that like where do you do that at so i was starting from scratch all right. So where, where did you, did you first go to just like join the Academy? I mean, this is what year is this we're talking? Um, this was uh, mid eighties, like 1987. I got hired by ATF in 1987. I came to ATF. Uh, they have the most dynamic undercover program in federal law enforcement. Right. And like, I, I wanted to be a fed I wanted to be a, uh, an undercover agent, or at least wanted to see if I could. I wanted to see if I had the skills to do that. And uh, being on the, in the undercover program at ATF was the equivalent of playing shortstop for the New York Yankees. It was as good as it gets, man. It was the top, top tier. Wow. And so you made it there. How long did it take you to get there? Was that kind of a right end deal? Did they hire you right in? Did you have to go through any sort of training to get there? Yeah, that the, the process probably started in 1985, to be quite honest with you. And the, you know, the wheels of the federal federal government turn slow, man. Right. You know, you interview, you put applications in, you wait. This is a, a, like pre internet days, pre oh, yeah. uh, social media days, man. You know, you were like licking stamps and putting stuff in an envelope and putting it in the US mail and then waiting for the returns. There was no uh, uh, pull up a website and click and send in your answers. So right. Uh, as slow as the process is now, it was a million times slower then. Yeah. So when you get on, you actually have a crazy story of one of your first days on the job. I mean, just almost being your first and last week, so to speak. You want to give us a little yeah. insight on how that went down? Yeah, I got off to a, a pretty interesting start. Uh, I got hired on uh, and sworn in on a Monday, raised my hand, took my oath, was issued my badge, issued a gun, uh, had no idea what I was doing. Um, just just knew I wanted to try. Um, I, I think uh, I, you know, I've said before, and I'll probably say again, there's not a whole lot of things that I'm good at. Um, one of the things that I probably am is that I've always been willing. I've always been willing to try. Mm -hmm. Um, um, not necessarily always even smart about it, but I've always been willing to try whatever that is. So I get hired on a Monday and on a Thursday, I'm, uh, on a very, uh, deep perimeter team of an arrest scenario, mainly there to just see how it works, see what the mechanics are like. This is, this is what we do. Um, we show up at a suspect's house, uh, we're there to make the arrest. The suspect runs and just my natural reaction was to get in the mix. And, and I started chasing this suspect. And, you know, four, six isn't very fast in the NFL. Four, six is flying in Copland, <laughs> right? So I was like passing people. I was passing my partners. I was passing my, my peers on the chase for this guy. Um, we're in a, a really ratty, worn out uh, trailer park uh, way south of Tucson. And uh, you know, the dude cuts right, cuts left. He's gone, vanished like a ghost. Um, I was super frustrated. Um, I, like I wanted to, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show I was, I had value. I wanted to show that I was, I belong there. And, um, so the search for the suspect, um, uh, separates the, the agents and the, and the, the, the cop people that are there get spread out. And so I'm kind of poking through some grass and like, there's a bunch of other cops that are around and they're on the point. Well, this, this suspect had hidden and uh, I was kind of the last man in the conga line. And when I, when he got to the last guy, he popped up out of the grass. He had his gun out, put his gun in my face, uh, slipped around behind me. 
had my neck in a chokehold, held my held his gun to my head, um, started walking me back to a vehicle that was there at the scene. It was a it was a two door Monte Carlo. Uh, pushed me in the driver's seat, pushed the driver's seat forward, slid in behind me, his gun on my head the whole time, and he's screaming at me, "Let's go!" You know, I was going to be his escape mechanism. Right. He wanted me to drive him out. Um, and so, you know, my mind, uh, although was my mind was racing, my mind actually slowed down. Um, I could see the agents closing in on our vehicle. I could see the barrels of the guns out. I could see the suspect in the rearview mirror. I could see how crazy and wild he looked. I could see the gun on my head. Um, I looked forward and there was a telephone pole, maybe 30 or 40 yards in front of us. And my first plan was, uh, I'm going to put my seatbelt on and I'm going to ram this car into that telephone pole as hard as I can. Like this is the, the, there's no good ending to this. Yeah. Um, there's, there, there's, there's no really winning end for Jay Dobbins in this scenario. Like, like how can I create my best circumstance? So in my quick reasoning, I was like, man, like I'm going to, I'm going to blow this guy up into this telephone pole while my friends are here, while my partners and my peers are here and let them help resolve this versus driving this cat 20 miles down the road and having him execute me in a ditch on the side of the road. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, not a good alternative. <laughs> yeah. So I go to uh, start the car and then plan B hit. I grab the keys. I drop the keys to the floorboard. I kind of half lean back and said, you know, damn, I dropped the keys. When I lean forward to pick the keys up, uh, the suspect's gun came off my head. It moved to my back and that gave the people who had surrounded the car the opportunity they needed. And man, there was like a five or 10 second, like glass and lead storm, uh, crazier than anything you could ever imagine in the movies. Um, probably 20 rounds fired into the, into the vehicle from both sides, from the pass through the passenger side window, through the driver's side window, through the uh, rear window. Uh, the suspect was struck multiple times, X-ringed multiple times. In the process, his gun had moved uh, to my back and he fired around into my back. The round hit me between the shoulder blade and the spine, uh, point blank. It blew through the top of my lung. It narrowly missed my heart. It exited my chest. Um, and you know, man, I, I, I rolled out of the car. Um, the, the, the agents pulled the suspect out of the back seat of the car. His eyes were already rolled back in his head. He already had a death rattle. This dude was, he wasn't long for this world. But I looked at my chest and I had blood squirting out of a hole on the left side of my chest, like you're holding your thumb over the end of a garden hose. Um, you know, so four days on the job, I was four days on the job, I was bleeding to death in the trailer park, I actually uh, uh, anticipating that you would ask me that question. Um, pulled this shirt out. If you can see it like that hole right there. That's the shirt. Uh, that that hole right there is where the bullet went in my back. And there's a hole right here in the front right there where it came out of my chest. Holy cow. Um, and so, you know, after, uh, after four days, I was bleeding to death in this trailer park. You know, with ATF, we get paid every two weeks. I, I, I was still a week and a half away from getting my first paycheck. Wow. So now well, let me ask you one question back up just a second. When you dropped those keys, was that your plan to be able to get out of the line of fire, if you will? So your, you know, comrades in arms could make that shot or would that just something that kind of happened or it, uh, it, it was a, uh, an intentional action to drop the keys, but, uh, by no means am I trying to portray that as like some master plan that I had figured out in advance saying, you know, if this ever happens, this is a solution. Right. Um, it was very spontaneous and, um, you know, it was, I, I, I think in hindsight, it probably was the right decision to make. I don't oh, know yeah. if there was, I don't, I, I was pretty much out of choices. Cause you had to um, trust that your, you know, your other cops would notice what you were doing. Notice that they had a clean shot. Cause obviously if you're still sitting up, you know, they don't want to risk shooting into the car and hitting you. 
Love and that was the, that, that you, was their reaction, you know, even, right. even when he had me, um, when he had me by the neck, when he had me in a chokehold and had the gun to my head, there was agents afterwards that said, man, like I had no shot. Yeah. I had no shot that wouldn't have jeopardized you. Right. So they were looking, for, they were waiting for an opportunity and, and I did my best to try to create one for him. Now, in the midst of that, when he fired at you, was that while they were still shooting up the car? Because it seems like to me, if that, I don't know if that would make you go further down in the seat or make you want to pop up in pain. How did that happen? Wait, I'll tell you what, man, it happened so fast to say that I had kind of any kind of intentional reaction after the gunfire started. I, if, if I did, I can't remember what it was or, or, or what my reaction was. It happened that fast. So they, what, they just load you in a car and just hightail it to the nearest hospital? Actually, the, the same car that, that I was uh, shot in. The Monte Carlo. pulled the suspect out of the back seat, pushed me back in the back seat where the suspect had just been killed, uh, and, uh, and raced me to the hospital in this car that, like, had all the windows blown out of it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I get to the hospital, and um, I'm... I'm um, like, like losing a lot of blood, I'm in and out of consciousness, and they put me on a gurney. And I remember a nurse, I'm looking up at this nurse, and she's wheeling me towards uh, an emergency room towards an operating room. And um, I hear the doctor yell from behind her, like, I'm gonna need a chest tube, because I was I was suffocating on my own blood, right? Uh, one lung was collapsed, that chest cavity, that element of my chest cavity was filling up with blood, the other lung was compromise. I was spitting blood. I was choking on blood. Um, and I remember I looked up at this nurse and I said, man, like, am I going to live? And she just looked down at me and she said, you're hurt bad, baby. We don't know yet. And I was like, uh, man, like you need to work on your bedside manner, man. I need, yeah. a, I need a better answer than that. You need to I lie to me right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go and give me a laugh, please. <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, we're having this conversation. So it was a successful surgery. What was your recovery like for that? Well, you know, I'll tell you what I, I um, again, the, the many blessings I've received in my life, there was a trauma surgeon in Tucson who um, ultimately was became one of the most famous doctors in the world, a, a trauma surgeon named Richard Carmona, who ultimately became the United States Surgeon General. He was a young surgeon and he was in charge of the trauma center here in Tucson. He like heard what happened. He, he was a, a law enforcement officer himself. Um, in addition to be a, to be in a, tra a trauma surgeon, wow. um, he heard what happened. He took the case over. He patched me up. Um, it was, you know, I was in the hospital and the ambulance chasing attorneys were like literally lining up in the hallway oh, to I talk to me. Were. And, yeah. you know, they were coming in and they were saying, hey, kid, you know what a million dollars looks like? Man, I, I didn't know what a million dollars. I, I grew up in a blue collar house. My dad was a carpenter. You know, he pounded nails for a living. <laughs> um, how about five million dollars? How'd you like five million dollars? It, it, it didn't make any sense to me. And their their argument was or their sales pitch was that you never should have been in that situation. You weren't properly trained. The government ATF has assumed a huge liability for you. Um, tell me how much money you want. Tell me how many zeros you want me to get on a check and I'll go get it for you because they want you and this story and their liability to go away. It'll never see a courtroom. This is generational money. This is money that you will live on. And if you play it right, your kids and their kids will be just fine. Um, I, I, all I could think of was get out. I, 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 I didn't ever take that job for the money. I never did anything for the money. I, I haven't ever done anything for the money. Um, uh, it, that's, that there's no cop I ever met who took a badge and a gun, uh, believing, even hoping that someday he'd become rich. It's not part of the equation. Right. Yeah. I think like cops and maybe school teachers, are two professions and, and I'll maybe even say firefighters too. throw that in there. Those are professions that you go in because you want to help people, not because you're going to get rich. Now, yeah, doctors, you could maybe say doctors would, but they're going to get rich in the process because they're doctors. 
but yeah, teachers, I think those public top. servants, yeah, absolutely, uh, fit that profile. Uh, teachers are my heroes. Yeah, um, teachers impacted my life uh, in in amazing ways when I was young. Um, you know, and to any teachers that are out there listening, um, I love you. I admire you. Um, I respect you. We ask teachers to uh, teach our kids how to read and do math and and spell sentences. Um, but then we also ask them to uh, check lockers for paraphernalia, check backpacks for guns, check heads for lice, check arms and legs for bruises, um, socialize them, uh, teach them manners, all those things. And then we underpay them and give them a piece of chalk and a blackboard and drop our kids off and say, no, handle that. Yeah. Yeah. No, when, when COVID hit um, and a lot of people were having to basically – you know, have their kids homeschooled. I think it opened a lot of parents' eyes to exactly what those teachers were putting up with because they're having to deal with just their one kid. Imagine it being 25 kids, you know, they're having to put up with that. And in some cases, like I live in an overcrowded neighborhood, as we talked earlier before we got on here, I'm in Charleston. The neighborhood that I'm in has blew up so fast. And there's so many kids in the community that I'm in. We've got our own schools. But it's so many people that came here, people that live in this community who are literally a mile away from the school are zoned for other schools because there's so many kids. Like there's, there's not enough room. They got overcrowded and it blew up so fast. And these teachers were drastically, like you said, drastically underpaid, but just understaffed. And it there's was such an important, uh, such an important part of our society, such an important part of the development of our young people. And, um, when I get president, I'm going to make sure that the wages for teachers get raised. Until then, like, good luck, man. Keep doing your best for us. Well, I, I believe you probably just earned a lot of votes there if any teachers are listening. My wife's actually a guidance counselor at the school, so she sees a lot of that of, of what goes on. And it was, it was yeah. hard for COVID because, I mean, people don't realize exactly when they took those kids out of school, exactly how many kids relied on going to school and those being their meals for the day their, their lunch, their breakfast, you know, that was sometimes those, that was the only meals those kids got. And Absolutely. It, it was a lot, it was a big effect. I mean, for everybody, but especially, you know, for those in some unfortunate situations. So teachers yeah. and uh, the people in those, in, in our education system, uh, they, every day, yeah. every day, they change lives. You do not have to carry a gun on your hip to change people's lives. Yep. Now you got out of that, you know, pretty decent shape. How, how long was your recovery for that? You know, it, like I was in such good shape. I was, you know, like we talked about, I was an athlete when I was young. Um, I was in, in outstanding physical condition, which helped my recovery. Um, I got shot on November 19th, 1987. And I came back into the office before Christmas. So I was, I came back to the office in a month. And I remember I walked in the office and my boss was like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, like, what do you mean? Like, I didn't get fired, did I? Um, he's like, dude, he goes, work comp. You, he goes, you got 90 days without question, work comp. You'll get 90 days after that if you want it. You'll get another 90 days after that. He goes, you could probably like not come to this office for a year if you wanted to. And I'm like, wait a minute, man. You know, I was 26 years old. I was like, you think I took this job to sit on my couch and, and, and watch TV? Like, I'm back. I know I can't do everything. I know I'm not prepared uh, physically uh, to do a lot of the elements of the job, but I'm here to work, find something for me to do. Well, well, they found something for you to do and you actually got hurt again, not too long after that. Right. Well, how, what was the time frame between when you got shot and your next kind of brush with death? Well, it was, you know, um, the, the, the Tucson shooting happens. And I, and I, like I mentioned, I wanted to work undercover and I told my bosses that after the shooting and they're like, dude, you can't, you're not going to be able to do it here. Like, first of all, you grew up here. Second of all, you played college football here. Now you've been in this shooting that's got all this publicity. Um, everyone knows what you're doing. Um, it ain't going to happen. And my reaction was like, well, then find a place where it, where it will, because uh, that's what I want to do. Um, I ultimately got transferred to uh, Chicago um, and was working there and, and absolutely loved working in Chicago. The work was great. My partners were great. There was a bunch of young people that had the exact same mentality that I did towards the job. Um, and then about, uh, 18 months after the Chicago shooting, I was in another shooting in Chicago following a, uh, an undercover reversal sale of machine guns to some gang members outside of Joliet, Illinois. 
uh, me and my partner um, uh, got in uh, uh, an arrest scenario after some undercover activity was done. And uh, the escaping gang members uh, ran me over with their car and, and, uh, and uh, were shooting out of the windows and I was shooting at them. And um, luckily the second time I was smart enough to keep my bulletproof vest on, I got hit, but I got hit in the vest that time. Um, got run over by the car and uh, shot the driver in the process. And so, you know, within 18 months of signing on, I had been in two like serious, like uh, movie quality, like gun battles um, as a very young agent. Fucking Rasmutinous guy over here. He just won't go away. <laughs> I mean, definitely blessed, you know, not to take nothing away from that. Either one of those scenarios would have been easily you not being here no more. You know, I think both of them, when I look at them very seriously, and I think um, just about any cop I know that's got any time on his belt can start listing, whether it be a handful, dozens, hundreds, uh, the old timers, maybe even sometimes thousands of events where they look back and reflect on what happened and say, um, I probably should have died that day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I have those, I have those and more, but like, yeah, really all the circumstances, you put everything together. Um, I had God's hand on my shoulder. He, like he, he wasn't quite done with me yet. So all of that has taken place. If you've not already had enough brushes with death, you decide to take on probably one of the toughest assignments. I'm assuming at that point in your career, uh, did you, did you volunteer for this or was, you know, were you told about it? I mean, how did that come about your infiltration into the hell's angels? Yeah. You know what? Undercover work, at least with ATF is entirely voluntary. Like they can't force you to do it. They can't say, Hey, you're going to go undercover on gang X or on target Z. Um, like they can't make you do that. Um, you have to raise your hand and, and, uh, you know, uh, like I sought those opportunities. That is what I wanted to do. I loved it. I was challenged by it. Um, so prior to the hell's angels case, prior to the opportunity that was presented there, I had 15 years of, of undercover work under my belt from when I hired on and got shot to when the hell's angels case, uh, presented itself, you know, and over those 15 years, I packed as much knowledge and, and experience in undercover work as I could, um, over the course of my career, I had, uh, well over 500 undercover operations under my belt. Um, now is this all in Chicago? No, there, you know, I, I, uh, I was in Tucson. I was in Chicago. I came back to Tucson. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was just, but if, like from gun deals, from pop guns to, uh, to rocket launchers, you know, drug deals from like street dope to cartel level dope, uh, explosive cases from homemade, uh, pipe bombs and IEDs to servo activated remote controlled C4 devices, uh, uh, gang infiltrations, uh, individual one-on-one -on -one undercover operations, uh, infiltrated home invasion uh, organizations. I portrayed myself to be a uh, con contract killer in murder for hire cases. So, um, man, I, like I was all in. I was all in and I, and that's, that's what I love. That's what I wanted to do. And I pushed myself into those cases, every chance I got. Now, I may be, you know, going off on a limb here, but I'm betting the same high that you got on those undercover operations probably rivaled like the high you got when you were playing Notre Dame, you know, and, and USC and stuff like that, that, that adrenaline rush. Was that, is that pretty accurate? I, I think that's probably true. Um, I think different, but the same, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the same, scenarios. Uh, yeah. the same endorphins, you know, when you're yeah. playing college football, when you're playing football and you know, there might be uh, 80,000 people in the stands, it's not life and death, but it's, it's right. important. Yeah. Um, you know, you got a lot of eyes on you. You got people watching you. Um, but ultimately professionally, um, and, and this is, th this ultimately became a, a, an unhealthy situation for me. Um, undercover work was my heroin. It was, it was what got me high and I needed that fix all the time. Wow. So at, th at this time, are you married? Are you in a relationship at this time? Yeah, I've been married for, uh, 30 something years. 
And, uh, you know, I've got a wife and a couple kids and, um, we talked about heroes and I talked about, uh, teachers being my heroes. Really my hero hero is my wife. She's wow. way better than I deserve. Um, she, I was working undercover when I met her, she's been, um, you know, involved, uh, by my side through, uh, all of these events and, um, like a, a way better, uh, woman and just a way better person, a way better human being than, than I ever deserved to have in my life. Yeah. It takes, I would imagine a special kind of woman because, you know, your story is, is not a lot. If people are not familiar with yours, I'm sure they've seen movies. that's kind of rivaled it like Donnie Brasco and, uh, you know, even like the fast and the furious franchise where they have to spend so much time away from home that that starts to become their family as opposed to their actual family. So I'm sure that added a tremendous amount of stress, you know, on your personal life. Now we're, oh. we're when you were doing this and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but when you were doing this, were you able to communicate with her? Did the club know you were married or was it completely cut off? Was there, no, did they not have any idea you were married? You How know, did I did. I, um, uh, good undercover operators build their, their persona and their cover story as close to the truth as they can. Right. Um, so I, uh, I took the truth of my life and I took elements of my life and I morphed them into an undercover role. Um, and one of the elements was that I was divorced and had a couple kids because, uh, if you're going to do it, and if you're going to do it for a length of time to think that you're never going to cross paths with a suspect without your family with you. And somehow they are insulated from those situations, those social, social situations, uh, you're, you're silly. Right. Um, but you know, like back on point with, with what you said, um, I think that's a super important point that you made. Um, and I am, I'm the poster child for getting it wrong. Um, what I did as an undercover agent evolved from being what I did for a living and it became who I was. Um, and when that happens, you're dangerous. You're dangerous to yourself. Right. Yeah. When, the, when the lines start getting blurred, you know, that's, uh, that's never a good sign. But like I said, I don't want to jump too far ahead. You get the opportunity for this. I'm assuming you jumped on it pretty quick. Now, I don't know how true to form some of the shows as I've watched, but tell our listeners kind of how this evolved. Was it just you? I know you had some guys with you when y'all, you know, began this whole operation. Kind of tell us who was with you, your setup story and the prep that you had to get done to do this because even though back then, like the now social media is so prevalent, you can almost find out anything about anybody back in those days, you know, not so much, but at the same time, the hell's angels aren't your run of the mill motorcycle club. They've got ways of finding out if you are who you say you are, they've got contacts, they've got dirty, you know, please cops. I mean, you know, they can find out if any of what you're saying is bullshit very, very easily. Yeah. The hell's angels, uh, in a nutshell, are an international organized crime syndicate, uh, biker gang, um, the most notorious biker gang on the planet, the most recognized biker gang on the planet. Um, in the in the hierarchy of that world, they're the kings of the mountain. They're at the top of the hill. Um, and yeah, you're right. They have uh, an amazing intelligence network. Um, even back, you know, this case started in 2001, um, even back then. They, they, they're the masters of, of gaining information. They're uniquely paranoid. Um, they have to be. They're paranoid. That's how they stay out of prison yeah. is to not trust people, to not embrace people, to not let people that they don't know get close to them. Uh, so um, they were operating with uh, near impunity, you know, in the West Coast. They, there was a lot of violence surrounding these guys and they were like pretty much left unaddressed. And uh, my case agent, uh, an ATF agent named Joe Slatella, uh, wanted to do something about it. And he approached me and asked me if um, I would be willing to work with him and, and lead the undercover uh, operation. Um, I've said this many times. Joe Slatella is the smartest cop that I ever knew or, or probably ever would, knew, would know. If um, the, the, the strongest thing I can say about Joe is that if one of my kids was kidnapped, 
And I could pick one cop to figure out who took them, to go get them, and to make sure everything was settled up nice and square, it would be Joe Slatella. So your right hand for sure. Um, so, and, and from what I've seen and, and read, I don't want to spoil too much about your book because I want to actually, you know, recommend that to anybody that finds this interview, you know, interesting go ahead and go get the book. Not just one. You actually have two now, correct? I do. I, the first book I wrote was uh, no angel, which is the story of, uh, there you go, which is the story of my, uh, uh, infiltration of the, the Hells Angels motorcycle gang. And then I wrote a follow up book, which is more of a memoir style book called Catching Hell, which has a big, a, a bigger picture story um, and touches on some of the things that we talked about earlier, the shootings I was in when I was young, uh, some right. football, like how football brought me into law enforcement. Um, so yeah, so I have two books out there. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. We're going to link them up in the uh, show notes when we post this. But you guys come up now was the what was it the solo angels was that the club that you guys were represent was that an actual club was that a real club or was that something you guys made up that was a real club you know and and uh, i think it's important to say uh and put on the record that um no, no, no one in this job no one in this profession accomplishes anything by themselves right. um i had joe slatella as a case agent but i had undercover partners mm -hmm. um uh, there was task force officers that were assigned all different types of duties to, to, you know, from, uh, intelligence gathering to surveillance, uh, to you know, any position or job you can think of in an undercover operation. We had those covered. Um, I had a Phoenix police department officer who was, uh, my sidekick, who was, a, uh, an agent. We had a couple of informants that helped us. Uh, there was two other ATF agents. Uh, one of which was a female that ultimately played the role of my girlfriend in the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a very close knit type tight uh, and tight um, task force. And um, the original plan was, was not an infiltration plan. The plan was a side by side plan, get next to these dudes. Let's find out who's responsible for the violence. Uh, the way that, uh, that Joe developed the plan to do that was there was a uh, biker gang that was centered in Tijuana, Mexico, uh, named the Solo Angels. And uh, we had an informant in there and we met with the Solo Angels and we basically cut a deal with them, which said, we're going to wear your patch. We're going to wear the Solo Angel patch in Arizona. We'll be a nomad charter of the Tijuana Solo Angels. And we are going to put you next to the biggest, baddest biker gang the world has ever seen. It's going to be amazing for your credibility. Uh, we're going to go run guns and sell drugs and do all the things that people do in biker land. Uh, we will cut you in on our profits and uh, make it worth your while. And uh, we sold the Solo Angels. And we ultimately wore, uh, became members of the Solo Angels, infiltrated one gang, the Solo Angels, uh, not to investigate them solely for the purpose of using their patch and their credibility in that world to investigate another biker gang. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, I bet they did jump at that opportunity. I mean, that's you, you're, you're letting them do everything they're not supposed to do, but with your blessing and still profiting from it. <laughs> yeah. That we, like, like we sold it good. You know, we sold it to them, uh, in a very, uh, strong and believable and attractive way to them. Like, wait a minute, you guys are just, you're going to be in, in our gang and wear our patch. Um, but then you're going to elevate us. You're going to make us more powerful. Um, and we're going to get paid. Um, it was, you know, it was a deal that was too good to say no to. Well, now let me ask you this. Did you guys have anything on them? Were there, were there cases on those boys? Were they kind of, it was either that or jail or did y'all just offer that tool? No, it was just a 100% used car salesman job, man. Uh, we went in there and presented ourselves and were believable and convinced them that, um, that that was uh, good for everybody involved. And, uh, and then, you know, the next thing, you know, uh, we're running around in Arizona as solo angel, Arizona nomads. Wow. All right. So that, that part of it's done. Um, when did you first make contact with anyone involved with the hell's angels? When, when was that? Well, you know, it started slow. Originally it started, I, I was already kind of uh, around the, the edges of this case, around the Hell's Angels uh, periphery, uh, before the Solo Angels element, I'd, I'd attended biker runs. I'd been at uh, at Hell's Angels parties. Uh, it, in my role as 
Jaybird Davis, the the gun runner, the the debt collector, which was part of my cover story. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I was at uh, I was in Laughlin, Nevada, the night of the big shootout between the Hell's Angels and the Mongols at oh, the Harris there. Casino. Um, uh, the Mongols are the Hell's Angels blood rivals on the West Coast. Long standing uh, bloodbath feud war with that gang between those two. Right. Uh, two like really really rough groups of boys, man. I'll tell you, um, no nonsense uh, when it comes to those dudes. Now, were you and, undercover uh, at that point when that happened? Yeah. 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 Were you, yeah. you weren't, were you with the angels or you were still with solo angels at this point? I was, uh, I was, uh, actually just like kind of an independent associate of the hell's okay. angels. I was with them at the Flamingo hotel in Laughlin right. the night of the shooting, they left the Flamingo went to the Harris casino where the, yeah. where the riot took place. But I was, I was with all of those cats, uh, the night it broke bad. Wow. So you were in that, you were in the casino when everything went off the rails. No, I, I was I was in the in the Flamingo Hotel, which was okay. where the Hell's Angels had based themselves for the right. Laughlin River Run. Yeah. Um, and they got they called, left the right? Flamingo, rode down uh, Casino Boulevard to uh, the Harris Casino, and confronted the the Mongols there. Yeah, and if any of our listeners uh, aren't familiar with this, this was a lot of that was captured on tape. And I mean, there are some. I mean, there's there's looks like stabbings, there's beatings, there's one guy's shooting. I mean, and all this is captured on tape. And I don't know how in the hell no innocent people got hurt. I know a few bikers died, but no innocent people got hurt. And there's footage of everybody like laying behind bars and up under blackjack tables. And I mean, you know, you open fire in a casino, man, especially with something like that with all those people. I, I mean, it's a blessing for sure that nobody got hurt. Um, obviously, you know, like we said, there was some fatalities in the biker world, but that's not something to be taken lightly because as you're embarking on this, that, you know, was just the beginning of like a huge war, which will play in later on, you know, in your, in your case, but that was a huge war at that time that you were coming into. So not a, not the best time, I guess, to try to be getting into all this. Well, you know, yes and no, not the best time because the violence was so extreme, but yes, the best time, because man, uh, like no one trusted anybody. Everybody was, everybody was looking at everybody else. And so it leveled the playing field a little bit. Um, that, that shootout, um, you know, I was operating independently. I had an undercover house in Bullhead city, Arizona, which was directly across the Colorado river from Laughlin, Nevada. Um, and I had established some, some contacts with the hell's angels after the shooting, when Laughlin got locked down and people couldn't get in or out, there was hell's angels that crossed the river and came to my undercover house for a safe house and stashed, uh, weapons and, and, and stashed things that had been used you know, items that had been used and were evidentiary in the shootout. Um, and it served, it served its purpose for our investigation because it was the, uh, the impetus that we needed to really kick off and, and go at these hard, the, the, the Laughlin, the Laughlin, uh, shootout, uh, and that was in conjunction with uh, uh, an unsolved homicide where Hell's Angels uh, in the Mesa, Arizona chapter were suspected of murdering an innocent woman. Uh, they had brought her to the, Mel's, the, the Hell's Angels Mesa clubhouse, uh, had an altercation with her. They stomped her to death in the clubhouse and they drove her uh, to the desert outside of Phoenix, outside of Mesa, to a uh, desert area in a town near Apache Junction, Arizona and uh, dropped her body and cut her head off. Um, Holy cow. And so like, like we knew we were dealing with some bad boys, right? So between the Harris riot, the Cynthia Garcia murder, um, I was in place in Bullhead City. I had already established a reputation uh, in the criminal community there. Joe Slatella like kicks off this uh, investigation and it was a perfect storm of circumstance and people and all those things to go make a run at these guys. Now at that time was, was Christy still kind of high up in the ranks when that went down? Cause I know, I think that's, it wasn't long after that. That's when he got exiled or however you want to word it. Yeah. George Christie was uh, the president of the Ventura uh, charter of the hell's angels in California and was a very uh, uh, well-respected admired feared by some uh, hell's angels leader. He was like, he was, you know, a part of their history, a part of their, a part of their culture. Now, and was, was Cavazos in power over the Mongols at that time? Or was that after that when he 
came. I want to say maybe he got into power after that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you know what? I think Ruben uh, may have been the, the the president of the Mongols at that time. I I, I would be uh, uh, deceiving your audience if I if I started speaking like I knew what was going on with the inner workings of the Mongols at that point because they were just this big enemy that was out there, the Mongols, and we were the Hell's Angels, and and they were they were the bad guys, and we were the good guys. Right. Now, so this this riot is taking place, like you said, tensions is at an all time high. At what point did you kind of see your opening to okay, let me let me try to get in here with these guys? Because at some point they they kind of gave you guys an ultimatum, right? It's, you know, you're either gonna join us or you know that's that's the end of this relationship. We did. That's deal. when we put the uh, the solo angels uh, cover story into play. Um, started uh, flying solo angels colors, going to Hell's Angels events, making friends, befriending people. Um, one of the primary uh, players on the Hell's Angels side that uh, that I became close to was a guy named Bad Bob Johnston, who was the president of the Hell's Angels in Mesa, Arizona, where Cynthia Garcia was murdered. Right. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in Mesa, uh, getting to know the, the the charter membership there, befriending those people. Um, expanding that to other charters, expanding that then outside Arizona borders, meeting people in San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, San Bernardino, uh, Ventura, uh, Oakland, San Francisco. Uh, I, I uh, had some crossover with uh, Hell's Angels in the Chicago area, cross Angel, Hell's Angels, cross paths with them uh, in the New York City charter. Uh, met international hell's angels that were in the country for parties and stuff. So our network just kept growing and growing and growing and meeting more and more people. And uh, it, it, it got, uh, it got enormous all like behind this solo angel cover and, and myself as Jay bird Davis, uh, this gun running debt collector, uh, quasi contract killer. Now you had a guy with you in, in one of the shows. They called him Pops. Was that an informant? He wasn't a cop. He was just an informant with you. Pops was an informant that I had worked with well before the the Hell's Angels case. He was a reformed uh, meth addict, a reformed meth cook. Um, I had grown uh, very close to Pops. We had worked on cases uh, prior to the Hell's Angels case, um, and um, you know they say you can like don't ever trust your informants. Don't ever trust your sources. I trusted Pops, um, right or wrong. I had been down a lot of dirty roads with him, um, and he was he was amazing in helping us because he brought this appearance and knowledge of how the drug game is played. He didn't bring it from a cop's perspective, or didn't he? Brought it from having lived it and breathed it. Right. There yeah. was nothing. There was nothing counterfeit about Pops. He wasn't faking anything. Pops was Pops. He was a freaking uh, a, a, a meth addict and uh, and a meth cook. And um, it's really hard to pretend to be that if you've never been that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like you said, it gets that uh, intelligence, I guess, from the other side of the fence, the opposite of, of what you guys know. He knows the other side of the fence very well. Yeah, Pops was amazing. And I didn't treat Pops like an informant. I treated him like a partner. I treated him like an equal. And doing this, you know, what you guys are doing, like you said, I, I don't want to understate how dangerous this was. Cause if you guys get found out, if you get made, you're dead. I mean, there's just, there's no way around it. You're when not, you're running with these cats, it. man, if they figure out that you've been lying to them, deceiving them, uh, tricking them, they're not the kind of guys who say like, Hey man, we figured out who you are and we'd prefer that you don't come around anymore. You're going to yeah. catch a baseball bat on the back of the head, or someone's going to drag a straight razor across your throat. Wow. I mean, just for for our people that don't know, I mean, I know, you know, in the recent years, there was a, a TV show that came about that was a huge success called Sons of Anarchy. Um, and that got a lot of people eyes on kind of the inner workings of somewhat of how MC culture is. Now, there was a scene in there in the first season where a guy that was in the club, he left and came back to town. He was kicked out the club and they noticed that he still had all his ink on. Uh, after he had been kicked out of the club. Well, by their rules, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but by their rules, if you leave, be it, you know, for whatever the reason, that is technically, even though it's on your body, that's their property. That's their, those are insignias and what have you. All that comes off. Now, it can come off a couple different ways. 
and none of them are real pleasant. And so that's what they're doing that people was involved with. Now I can imagine what the hell they would do to people. They found out they were cops. Well, there's, you know, uh, and, and I testified in these cases, there's cases where people impersonated a hell's angel, uh, portrayed themselves to be a hell's angel in the public eye when they weren't, they murder, they kill them. Yeah. That's what they do. Um, now, you know, your example is derived from the Sons of Anarchy television show. And I'll tell you what, they, it, it's derived uh, based in reality, based in fact. Mm -hmm. Kurt Sutter and his researchers and in his investigators and the people that consulted on that television show, they were smart. Yeah. They knew what they were doing. I mean, these guys knew what they were talking about. Uh, they weren't inventing. This wasn't the figment of some writer's imagination. Those are real life events and scenarios that they put in play and put on television for us. Well, the guy that was in there, um, did you watch the show? I did. Did you like it? I did. I, I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed it for what it was worth. It was entertainment. Um, great entertainment brings us into a world that we would not normally enter on our own Correct. and lets us experience it for, you know, an hour a week or at a movie for two hours sitting in a theater. Um, I thought they did a great job of that. I, 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 I think the, um, uh, not my dispute with it, just kind of what makes me laugh is that the people that portrayed the, those actors and those roles on television, they were all beautiful, man. They were all like, they were all attractive people, man. You know, uh, Jax is, is a beautiful man. Yeah. Um, the reality is, man, none of us, myself included, like look that good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he attracted a lot of the female fans. I think he was actually, they pegged him to play the uh, Christian Grey and the 50 shades of gray movie. He was actually their first choice. And because he was in the midst of the sons of anarchy, he was afraid that playing something so opposite might hurt the reception for his character on sun. So he turned it down. I know that upset probably half the women in America that watched that show. Well, but. you know what? I think that that actors make those decisions and, and they, and they get so identified with a part or with a role, especially like on a reoccurring episodic television show um, you know, uh, Charlie Hunnam is, is forever in, in my mind, Jack's teller. Oh yeah. Yeah. He'll uh, never be nobody else to me. You know, it's hard to do that. You know, like, like growing up, like from my age, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, but, uh, Alan Alda is always Hawkeye, man. Alan Alda is always the, the, the trauma surgeon on the mass unit, um, yeah. no matter what role he plays. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, you know, the, a blessing and a curse for those guys. Uh, the curse is that, it's hard to escape their identity with that role. The blessing is they did such an amazing job of entertaining us as the public that we, we love them for it. Yeah. And you can't see them, like you said, as nobody else, but them, but now speaking on what you said, you know, how they got a lot of the information uh, some of those guys that were in the TV show, his name is uh, David LaBrava, but he played happy on the TV show. Yep. He was actually a real life hell's angel for a long time. And later Several on, hell's Chuck angels. Zito. Yeah. Chuck Several Zito patch members, uh, hell's angels were in sons of Ec anarchy. Charlie, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Sonny Barger made yeah. appearances. Yep. Who's uh, like the Pimp. most iconic biker in the history of this planet. Yeah. Uh, hell's angel leader uh, was there. Uh, Rusty Coombs. Uh, had a role in it who like is uh, a, a big shot caller with the hell's angels. Um, Chuck Zito, yep. um, who, who is maybe uh, the most famous of the hell's angels, like at least in the Hollywood community and the entertainment right. business. I mean, Chuck's got his fingerprints on movies and television shows um, all over. Um, Chuck, the guys, Chuck you know, had a lawsuit against, I don't know if it was FX or Sutter. He claimed that the, the whole Sons of thing was originally his idea. Now, obviously, they squashed that lawsuit because he was later on in the show, I think around maybe season five. But originally, he had a lawsuit against those guys saying that that was his idea that he had pitched. Yeah, you don't want uh, Chuck Zito angry with you, man. That's a that's yeah. a cat that you would prefer to not tangle with. Right. Yeah. And, and obviously, they worked it out because he was in Oz. And, you know, finally enough in Oz, he was uh, Chucky Pancamo was more of the Italian, the mobster side of things. Um, but yeah, he, and he's a good actor. Yes, he's a good yeah. actor. You know what? And the thing, I think why the reason why Chuck's a good actor is because I'm not sure he's acting. I think yeah. Chuck in the roles he plays is Chuck. Yeah, that's him. That's him outside of it. I can see him being the exact same way if he's wearing a, you know, a cut and he's in, in, the, in the Angels for sure. Um, well, not to get too sidetracked here because we, we went on about that show. But when you're going into there, like I said, you had to trust 
pops, you know, with your life. Cause going in there, that's, it's really dangerous. And then we talked about how, you know, they would take those kind of measures. They would take, you know, tattoos straight off of people like they did in that show, be it with fire knife, cut it off, burn it off. I mean, did you ever see anything like that happen while you were there? I did. I did. I was, uh, I was a part of a few of those and wow. it's, uh, it's not a pleasant experience, man. You know, when, so you, you, when you become a hell's angel, you pledge yourself to that gang and, and they feel that anything that, uh, that has hell's angels or their death head on it is their property and it belongs to them. And, um, so you decide you want to leave the gang. There's people that leave in good standing. There's people that leave, uh, with their reputation, a positive reputation intact, and they're allowed to leave, uh, in, in good standing. And they're, you know, termed that simply out good, mm -hmm. but there's also people that leave in bad standing. Um, and so those tattoos, which the hell's angels believe belong to them, um, can be covered up, tattooed over. Uh, there's examples of tattooed over without bad tattooed next to it, but there's also examples of those, uh, tattoos for people who are unwilling to cooperate, being carved off them with knives, being burned off them with clothes irons, being ground off them with belt sanders. Um, when they decide they want that back, they're taking it back. Right. Yeah. That's, that's some brutal stuff, man. Now. You know, when they're, when you're taking stuff that serious, obviously, you know, they're not just, you know, handing out applications for this kind of thing. You guys had to work at it to get in there. Were originally, were you met with some reluctancy to trust you or by them? Because you had been around, like you said, you had been to a lot of parties. They knew your face. It's not like you just popped out of nowhere. And then I'm sure with your cover story, with the ability to make, you know, money with these guys is ultimately the goal is to make money. Was it a little bit easier or was they reluctant to try to let you guys in at first? Yeah, they were reluctant. I, like we talked about earlier, they're uniquely paranoid. They're, they're, they're very hesitant to trust outsiders and, and they should be. Um, uh, the, the membership of that gang, uh, the Hells Angels, the name, the Hells Angels, their cuts, their vests, uh, the death head, it's their religion. It's, it's as important to them as uh, uh, God is to Christians. Mm -hmm. Um, they will die for that. Uh, um, they, uh, they, 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 they take that life. They take that lifestyle, that brotherhood, very serious and everything else in their lives stacks up behind that. And that includes, uh, wives, kids, houses, money, cars, motorcycles, dogs, whatever you name that anybody might have in their life. That's important to them. Uh, the members of the hell's angels that gang, that name, that death head, that reputation trumps everything else. Wow. Now you guys, I'm sure were no exception to this when you decided you wanted to, or were given that ultimatum, you're going to patch in. You had to go through the prospecting phase, just like anyone else would, uh, g give our audience a little bit of insight and in what is involved in a prospecting phase for a hell's angel. Yeah, there's there's various uh, elements, uh, very le various levels of status uh, of your association with the Hell's Angels. There's simple associates who are like, uh, like almost like I started. I like I touched every one of those elements. There's associates who are friends of the gang who are not associated with anybody. They hang around. They um, um, buy T-shirts, go to runs, go to parties, uh, support the support the gang. Uh, then there's hangarounds and, and uh, the title is exactly what you are. You're hanging around. Um, you are a, a remote, loose, loosely attached member of the gang. Um, and while you're hanging around, uh, you're spending more and more time. You're getting closer to that inner circle. They're deciding if they like you, you're deciding if you like club life. And if you feel like this is something that, uh, that you want to pursue uh, after a period of time as a hangaround, uh, you're asked to prospect, which is a prospective member. Um, uh, I was told as a prospect, you're a member without his patch. And every day you're trying to prove yourself. And every day you're being tested. Um, and you're trying to show yourself to the membership that you're worthy of a full patch of being a member. Um, so you go from an associate to a hang around to a prospect. Ultimately, uh, if, you're, if you're deemed worthy to wear the patch, you get voted in to become a full member. And then the membership has its own hierarchy from uh, 
uh, international presidents, down to regional presidents, down to uh, uh, charter presidents. And then within the charters, there's uh, vice presidents and secretaries and warlords who are the, enforcer, the enforcers and road kings or, or road captains who um, uh, arrange the transportation and how the gang moves from point A to point B. And then, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's, as, as crazy as it seems, and as it loose as it seems from the outside looking in, there's actually a lot of structure to it. That's the word I was, I was just, I had it on the tip of my tongue was structure of how you just explained all that. Most people would, you know, it might gloss over that, but that's the structure of, you know, fortune 500 companies down the line. And Sonny, who we spoke about earlier, he was the man that kind of put all that together. I mean, coming in at a young age when he did, he didn't create it. I don't think he, he came in a few years after the fact, but when he came in, he took it over and he took it to the next level and he gave it that structure that, you know, that stability and the hierarchy, like you just explained. I've said it many times that Sonny Barger through like all these elements of his personality through like his uh, resiliency, uh, through his toughness, uh, through his charm at times, through his humor at times, uh, through his intellect. Um, he, he took the Hells Angels, which like he didn't invent the Hells Angels, you know, right. which started in San Bernardino, but he did establish the, the mother chapter in Oakland. Mm -hmm. But Sonny is responsible for taking this kind of ragtag group of guys and turning them into an international organized crime syndicate that not only is involved in illegal activity, but churns legitimate money too. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said many times, if Sonny Parger had used like all those skills that he was given uh, for good, he would have been the, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Um, the fact that he built what he built from what he had to work with is one of the most amazing uh, organizational accomplishments in history. Yeah, I, no, I agree 100%.